experience teaching and researching religion, gender security, and local governance. Paula Washa has published research regarding women's participation in local governance and um, recent research that we've been working on in regards to the role of women mediators. Uh, she studied, she's researched customary law, Afghanistan women, Afghan women's identity and social spaces in Afghanistan. And her research and work has taken her to Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Egypt, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, and Syria. And next week to Oman with us, uh, in collaboration with us um, as we explore women, women's roles in mediation that we'll talk about later. Paolo, I shall hand over to you to say hello, and then we'll go back and do inter an introduction um, for run a show. We'll introduce uh, Aisha, which is a colleague that's been working in this space with us, um, Venerable Nepan, Paolo Washa Hassan, and then Reverend Gary Mason. Thank you so much, Martine, for that wonderful introduction. That was quite a bit. I would have asked you to just <laughs> say I'm the interim director at USID, and that's great. Um, but I wanted to also thank uh, Alliance for Peace Building for hosting this conversation. It's a very important conversation on religion in track one and the role that religious actors have and can play in this space um, in really promoting peace building, uh, peacemaking, ceasefires, uh, all kinds of negotiations and agreement at the track one level. We really believe that this is important to understand uh, in order to be able to support and, uh, and promote more effectively around the world as we see that the world has so many conflicts, uh, some that are affected by religion that have some sort of a religious dimension uh, and others that don't, but still the role of religion can be very important in resolving conflicts and being a resource for building peace and calling for the moral and ethical reasons for why peace should be built in a specific society at the track one level, at the national level. So we know that you know, there's a lot of religious influence around the world on conflict dynamics and that it's really critical for practitioners and policymakers to really understand how to better partner with religious leaders and the people of faith that build peace. And so we hope that this presentation, the conversation today will lead to better understanding um, and continue the conversation as we develop this research and case studies on this to uh, really build out this field and understanding the role that religious leaders, religious actors can play in track one peace processes. So thank you very much over to you, Martin. Look forward to the conversation. Wonderful. Thank you, Paolo Asha. So we will start with Aisha. Aisha um, has been working with us for many years. She's an old, she's a, a good friend, family friend as well. Um, I think once you start working in this space, everyone becomes family in a lot of ways. So you'll see that as we walk forward. Paula, um, Aisha has been working specifically on the research that we've been um, engaged with that looks at the role of religious actors in track one peace processes with uh, a colleague named Tanya and Alex um, with Inclusive Peace. And I'll give you a little bit of background of Aisha. So for Aisha, we've got just a wealth of experience in the room, so it's a pleasure to be able to share this. Aisha is a researcher at Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. She previously served as the Associate Director and Assistant Professor of Practice at Georgetown University's MA Program in Conflict Resolution. And then before coming to Georgetown University, she served as a consultant for Religion and Peace Building Program at the United States Institute of Peace, and as an Assistant Professor in the field of Peace and Conflict Resolution at the School of International Service at American University in DC. She's authored numerous books, one being on Islamic narratives of war and peace in Palestine territories, and she's co-authored and edited volumes on anthropo anthology on Islam and peace and conflict resolution in Islam, uh, Precept and Practice. She's also written various books and chapters, journal articles on Muslim women's peace building initiatives, mediation, um, peace building and religion, conflict resolution, interfaith dialogue, and Islamic approaches to war and peace in Islam and nonviolence. One thing that she'll do with us today is she will highlight some of the key findings of the research um, that um, was finalized and will be published shortly uh, through USIP on the role of religious actors in track one peace processes and also share a little bit more about her work on a toolkit she recently developed that focuses on the role of women in, in Islam and peacemaking. All right, Aisha, over to you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Martin. It's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with all of you. And uh, thank you, Alliance for Peacebuilding, USIP, and um, ICRD for hosting this event. So I, 
I'm going to sh have a little PowerPoint, so I'm going to share that and just let me know if you are unable to see the PowerPoint. Here we go. So this research uh, that was uh, sort of done together with ICRD Inclusive Peace and United States Institute of Peace with my colleagues Tanya, Alex, and Max. Uh, really, the aim of this pro uh, program was to really understand uh, what role the religious actors have played in official peace processes. And it was um, it came out from a need that um, in, the, in the official peace processes um, level, religious actors have been much more invisible in, in the research and study. So we wanted to see how are the religious actors engaged in formal peace processes? What are the results of these engagement? Which phases of the process do they engage more? What kind of roles and functions they play? Do they have any impact or influence? And which, which factors supported or restricted their influence? So we uh, what we did was we first did a literature review, and then we organized a number of different consultations with religious actors from different parts of the world to get a better understanding of these. So the nature of the conflicts that religious actors took part in was mostly um, ethnic, religious, clan-based divides. They were not religious conflicts per se, but they were divided along religious, ethnic, or clan-based identity. So this was about 70% um, of the, of, of the uh, conflicts. Also, these conflicts were often politicized, but sometimes they were characterized or categorized as religious. And um, so what kind of religious actors were involved was another question that we asked. So we found that oftentimes prominent religious leaders played an important role, large and powerful faith-based groups, local and international faith-based groups, interfaith actors were another group that played an important role, religious aid organizations, religious civil society, and faith-based, uh, faith-inspired political parties. And we also looked at the role of uh, faith-based uh, women's organizations and individuals who have been working in this space, doing research in this space. We also found out that they have been involved at almost all phases of the uh, conflicts. Um, and uh, so particular with a particular em emphasis on early engagement. And some of them also played an important role in the implementation once an agreement was um, reached. We also asked the question, why do religious actors get involved in the first place? And we found that the norms and convictions was a leading factor and their desire to reduce hardships and suffering was some of the things that they have sort of uh, was the reasons. But really, especially when the religion was a fault line, we saw that religious actors became more involved. But, but also we also saw that there was a cost benefit analysis conducted by these religious actors to see uh, if, um, their participation, if their contribution would benefit the society, if they benefit the peace process. And their uh, political social influence was also an important factor. And um, we also looked at the other side of the uh, argument uh, to see why other parties who, involve, who are involved in conflicts involve religious actors. One of the things that we found out that uh, for a very, uh, the, Many religious actors had a long involvement in peacemaking and they had a long reputation. And unlike some other organizations that come temporarily during the conflict, many of these organizations had a long um, experience in the countries that they have been working in. So they were what we would call more of an insider partial um, mediators or actors in the conflict. We also saw that this involvement gave them much more legitimacy and uh, there are also motivations. They gave them more legitimacy because they were perceived to be doing this work for the sake of uh, divine, et cetera. So this was seen as a motivation that was uh, much more legitimate than many others. We also saw that um, religious actors were invited to or accept their services were accepted when they were powerful societal forces. And we saw that their organizational capacity and resources uh, were an important factor. Their connections with the community, their connections with different fact fractions, the resources that they have were an important factor. So the overall results of what happened is that we found that religious actors are highly trusted and very much respected when they are accepted as uh, actors in these conflicts. 
And um, religious values and texts provide an important resource uh, for the mobilizing the communities. And uh, so that was another important element. So we also found out that the influence of religious actors enhance, or so uh, we were asked the question whether the religious actors enhance or undermine the peacemaking. Um, they had their, what, what was important was that their important, strong connections with their constituents. Religious actors can be very powerful influencers of public opinion through their resources, through their sermons, through their um, ways of, in some cases, religious schools so they do have a high influence when self push for engage when they themselves push for engagement so we also found that the religious have been part, uh, particularly engaged when their own communities were involved in conflict in one way or another and if there uh, another reason that we found them being more engaged was that if their religious identity was threatened or if they perceived their religious identity to be threatened especially in polarized conflicts, religious actors that have both, that we see that um, they both supported and at times counteracted peacemaking act, uh, efforts. We have to also be aware that not all religious actors played a peaceful role, but some of them were resistant to peace. Some of them had their own interests, but we fo particularly focused on when and how they have um, sort of participated in peacemaking. So um, we saw that Many of the religious actors played the role of facilitation and mediation. That was one of the most prominent roles. And they also did a lot of advocacy for peace, advocacy for human rights. They also provided protection uh, of parties uh, just by being in that um, space, provided them with protection, uh, monitoring especially implementation of the agreements, they, that was something else that they did. Socialization people, of people through their resources was another role that we saw. They were influential in creating social cohesion. And we saw a lot of them uh, for working in the space of service delivery that was related to conflict or post-conflict uh, interactions. The modalities in, um, involved religious actors usually well, we looked at whether there was direct representation of these, um, um, if they were directly represented. Uh, religious actors played very different roles. And the most common um, uh, sort of, as we said, was mediation and facilitation. In these cases, they were not direct representative of the parties, but they were directly involved of the conflicts. They were particularly um, in influential in consultations. They served on commissions. Very rarely though, they did. Uh, there was one or two examples of being part of the problem solving workshops, but, and also public decision-making was um, much less, but they were very much involved in mass action. That was another thing that we saw uh, religious actors playing an important role. Uh, we also looked at um, the religious actors' inclusions, what whether they generate greater buy-in, and we did find out that the the when religious actors who are influential in their communities are involved in peace processes, they're more likely to generate greater buy-in among the communities, among their constituents, and it this increases uh, the likelihood of a successfully negotiating a settlement, and it also increases the chances of peace being much more sustainable and a piece that is based on uh, issues of social justice. We also uh, looked at the mobilization. Um, what are the, what ways that religious actors contribute to mobilization? We found that mobilization can occur through the existing structures such as the churches or the mosques, but also uh, we saw them, they create new forums or organizations, which was much more intercommunal organizations that they were influential in. We also looked at what factors enable or constrain religious actors' influence in formal peace processes. Unity within religious actors, it was very important in helping them to be more influential. Coalition building among different religious actors was a, a factor that contributed to their informant. Early involvement was something that we saw um, that was important. Their legitimacy, their trust in the religious actors was also very important. And um, their influence as powerful societal organizations. So if, or if in a society, religious organizations do not have that power, that legitimacy, they were not as influential. We also looked at or uh, they uh, 
religious actors who have resources and the organization capacity to uh, mobilize to reach out to communities were much more effective. And um, we also looked at the social political context. And in oftentimes, one of the things that was important was the state relationship with the church or the religious organization, what role, historical role the uh, religious groups have played in the conflict in, in the past. So our uh, lessons learned from our consultations re-emphasize this, this finding that the unity within religious traditions and coalitions between them is really key. But they, we also found out there was concerns raised about both the real and perceived politicization of religious actors. This could go both ways. Uh, so the uh, politicization of religious actors can also undermine the legitimacy of some of the religious actors. We also found out the balance between insider religious mediators and facilitators and outsiders, uh, actors drawn in through solidarity networks is very important. So that was something to be uh, aware of. And uh, we also need to be very careful of timing and sequence of, of actions uh, within the context. So many organizations who have a good understanding of the local context, who understand the parties and who are sensitive to the timing have been much more successful. So religious actors include more than just religious leaders. And we found out the teamwork is essential. So the community uh, actors who are inspired by their religion was also very important. And uh, so we sort of used the we were sort of uh, used the term religious and faith-based actors as a more inclusive term than just religious actors. And religious women and new and youth. Uh, needed to be much more consciously included. We saw that the way we uh, approach um, negotiations or po a positive, uh, uh, the first track diplomacy was much involving much more religious actors that happened to be males. So there needed to be much more um, focus on how we can engage women and youth in these processes. And uh, religious Actors also need to be educated how to navigate the politicized religion and differentiate between political and religious beliefs. So that was something that we also uh, learned from the challenges that they faced. And it was really important to have a network and exchange of experiences among different religious actors to share what they have learned. So what we come up with, the, so next as opportunities, so we need to develop robust focus case studies as a resource for both policymakers who are seeking to find better ways to effectively engage religious actors in track one and um, religious actors who are interested in engaging in formal peace processes. So we also um, are looking for ways and how to identify ways to create space for religious actors to engage, exchange and share their resources and support each other in this process. So how can we foster the ability of these actors to identify and connect with other actors, whether it's in their own national context or international context, and to think about developing consortiums and support mechanisms. But at the end of the day, it was very clear that the religious actors can be very influential and contribute to peacemaking in their communities, and they can be a major asset for track one processes, provided that they are mobilized for peace. As I said, not all religious actors were working towards peace. But uh, as I said, uh, one of the big gaps that we saw was engaging women in official track one peace processes. And um, so one of the things that Georgetown Institute of Women, Peace and Security that we did with the support for a number of different organizations, including USIP, is to develop an Islam and negotiation toolkit for Muslim women. So this action uh, guide was to sort of uh, help Muslim women uh, in particular we had first the idea of uh, uh, our first target group was Afghan women who were engaged in official negotiations. But this is a toolkit that is designed to help both uh, broader than Afghan women as well as um, Muslim men. Um, because what we've done is to sort of uh, look at, um, unlike other toolkits, what are some of the Islamic legal theological arguments to resolve conflicts peacefully through negotiation and incorporated to that is how do we advance gender justice? How do we use these theological arguments? 
And uh, so one of the things that this toolkit recognizes is that each negotiation context is unique and therefore informed by and shaped by its own historical, political, and religious context. So we have to be cognizant of that. And in many contexts like Afghanistan, religion can be a very powerful a source of religious, a source of cultural norms. And this can really have a big impact on the negotiation processes, key issues, and the outcomes. So recognizing this we uh, to effectively negotiate negotiators must understand not only this context but also adjust to the changing circumstances as they um, operate in this so and with afghanistan in our mind uh, so we looked at for example how religious language and reliance of islamic arguments can provide a level of legitimacy in context where islam plays an important role and how uh knowledge of those um, concepts, our knowledge in that, at least perceived knowledge in that area, provides those with power. And uh, so it becomes part of the political negotiation strategy. So women who are usually uh, excluded from negotiations or even uh, in participating in political or other social activities, uh, who are not aware of some of these legal, Islamic legal theological arguments are at a disadvantage in that sense. And so we wanted to balance that power based on knowledge. So because groups like Taliban frames their policies and actions in religious frameworks, we thought it was imperative for negotiations to learn this language and have a strong grounding in Islamic tradition, its sources. So the um, what we did in this toolkit is that we looked and collected Quranic, prophetic, and historical evidence and um, to support uh, first the process of negotiation and women's inclusion in negotiation processes all the way going back to the prophetic times. For example, during the Hudaybiyah peace process, there were at least two women involved in the official negotiations with the Meccans. So the I, so we also um, provided in the, the, the toolkit has two sections. The first section focused on Islamic conceptions of peace building negotiation. And so what we did is we combined both Western and Islamic um, approaches to negotiation. We provided sources of Islamic law, objectives of law from an Islamic point of view. We talked about the different contentious issues like meaning of jihad and Islamic approaches to build, build a peace building. But then we also specifically provided how Islam can be an asset, Islamic terminology, historical examples can be an asset at different phases of the negotiation and also how uh, some of these examples historical examples inform formation formation of the negotiation team from time management etc and even understanding power so we had examples exercises we have uh examples mostly from women historical women who have been, played an important role in negotiations throughout islamic history but we also have modern day examples as well and these are some of the ways in which to show you that we have case studies we have um, a sort of a, key points, we have exercises for the people to, who are interested in using this. And the second part of our toolkit focused on the Islamic legal and theological arguments regarding gender justice and how these could be incorporated into uh, official negotiations. So with this, we also have uh, Quranic historical examples as well as the prophetic examples, but we also have exercises and case studies. And we tackle issues of right to education, divorce, political participation, own wealth, etc. We also created three briefs um, that were more specifically uh, focusing on particular um, themes. So we published and translated these into diary, the girls' education, right to employment, and mahram. And we have worked on, but not yet published, five more uh, toolkits. So I, these are our um, supporters. We would like to thank all those who have helped us uh, put this together, supported us financially, or by reviewing, etc. Thank you so much. I just want to make sure that I did not take too much time. Thank you, Aisha, for sharing. And there had been a comment of whether or not we could share the toolkit. Um, we'll find it and put it into the chat box as well and share after for others that would, would like to have access to that and some more materials specifically about what Aisha's talking about. Thank you. Aisha, thank you. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. I will now move over 
to our dear friend who is calling in all the way from Thailand and up late with us again tonight. Um, Venerable Nepan is the assistant abbot at Bangkok School in Mount Temple and the director of the Institute of Buddhist Management for Happiness and Peace. He has designed and led trainings for Buddhist community leaders in Southern Thailand affected by violent conflicts to heal the victims um, and survivors and prevent further conflicts. He is a dear family friend also um, that has integrated well with our with our little ones. And so Venerable Nepan, thank you again for being here. And he has a colleague online named Pelin. I just wanna highlight her because she volunteers a great deal and supports uh, the work that Venerable Nepan does advance. So Venerable Nepan, I'm gonna hand over to you. Kapkumaka. Thank you very much, Martin, my big sister. And, and it's very really nice to see you here, all distinguished panelists and their, all the participants and when I heard I share, share her very thoughtful, you know, thought and, and lesson learned, I feel like I should, I should be the first one to share because she very great. And now I feel a bit, you know, <laughs> not comfortable because, you know, when you, when you need to follow the, 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 the great leader like this, it's not easy. So, uh, may I share this screen uh, to, I think from my point of view, it's more like a experience as a Buddhist monk. So you can see that regarding the roles of religious actors in peace building processes, I'm, I'm going to share my experience as a, a Buddhist monk who try to do my best. Uh, back to... Before we go to that, this is uh, what I would like to share. If faith-based organizations, FBO, work more effectively, maybe organizations like FBI don't need to work hard anymore. Uh, hopefully it's okay to say that. <laughs> and this is my contact. If anyone would like to, to exchange your experience with me, please feel free to cap this picture and I'm more than happy to, to exchange anything with you. So back to like 2000, 2010, uh, after the, the violence, the conflict happened in the southern of Thailand. I originally here in the center of Bangkok. That's my temple you can see from my background. And at that time, the National Office of Buddhism they're afraid that because at that time when some monks got killed by bomb or by gun or by knife and burn, so many monks moved out from the deep south. And when monks moved out from, from, from that area, then all villagers, they also move out from the area because they felt like when that spiritual, that spiritual leader, the moral, not there. They, want, they didn't want to stay there anymore. So, so many Buddhist population move out of the area. And the National Office of Buddhism of Thailand consulted with us and asked us to, to implement some project that support or stop monks and Buddhist population from, from migration from, the, from that area. So they call this project that the, the project promoting security of Buddhism in, in the deep south. At that time, I, because I already learned about the peace process in the special program of King Prashantipo Institute. And because of that, I, I felt like if we follow what the, the authority wanted us to do, it would become like a passive project because they didn't want monks and Buddhists to move out of the area. But my intention is to allow everyone to have a safe space and can live 
together happily. And at that time, you know, so many monks turned to be a bit violent because they felt like many monks got killed. Also, Buddhist lay people, they, they felt frustrated and suffer because they didn't know that when they went out in the morning, they're going to come back to their own family alive or not. So I shamed the, the way of the project into their like group counseling because I wanted to heal, you know, monks first and then invited all monks to be our Shane agent. We want to shame victim to victor, try to encourage them to work with, you know, our Muslim brother and sister and also try to calm down their people. So we provide them group counseling skill, project management skill, community development skill. And we brought monks, I mean, our groups who kind of expert in these kind of things over there. And they said that they're the first time that they got a chance to laugh. So we use, you know, quite simple way. We sit in the circle and have some activity that we can know each other. I mean, in inside their life, I mean, their, how they became a monk, uh, how they suffer, for example, because we wanted them to learn about themselves first and then provide the, the facilita facilitation and also group counseling skill because we wanted them to be the healer for their own people. Buddhist people over there. And before that, they needed to be, they need to be healed him, themselves first. And because of that, we, we know a lot of things. Like, so they learn, they, we, we sat like that. And then this is just some kind of the reflection that they share. They feel like because monks in Thailand, they are spiritual leader for normal people. It's just like monks protect them spiritually. But they said in, the, in that paper that in the past, all soldiers carry amulet and also protected by monks. But at that time, all soldiers need to protect monks because so many monks got killed. Even when, when they out for arms, in, for food in the morning. And that's kind of their, they, they depressed because of that. Uh, so from that moment, we, we kind of encourage them to, to go out in many provinces in the deep south and also work with them to calm people, to support senior people, young people, and also uh, implemented the project we call Yim Pra Yom, it means visited monks and visit lay people in very remote area to support them. And after that, when some monks got killed, I also, you know, stood up and spoke up in the national television that let the bomb destroy just only the body of Buddhist monk, but not the heart of Buddhism which is non-violence, because at the time, if we didn't uh, send the early warning, so many monks and lay people, because they suffer, they wanted to fight back, and which is not good at all. So because of that, they kind of they calm down and then they understand more. So because we have limited time, right? Because that work, and because of what I learned from the Martin here, I kind of the brought many things into the field of peace building. And eventually we got a chance to meet with the leader of Party B. And that in, in our neighbor country. And because of that, we got the attention from the government and it's kind of the, I cannot say that we engage with uh, track one, like uh, 
apparently every single time, but we try to be behind the scene because in the culture, uh, people also feel that monks shouldn't engage in politics that much as a religious leader because we need to to hold the right position. We cannot because you know that politics it kind of divided people. So we need to to I don't know to to be in the position that we can tell everyone what is the right thing to do. So in a way, it's quite difficult. But we also need to engage because as a Buddhist monk, as religious leader, if we don't try to invite or inspire Buddhists who are majority in the country, it's very hard to do that in the deep south, which Buddhist, which Buddhism is minority. Okay, and because of that, we try to engage with the, some organization like King Prashatipo Institute who work for their for the democracy and also peace work. And you can see that uh, this is called the Voices for Peace from Deep South to Policy Party, you know, all politics party. And then we also work with them like virtually later with ICSC to provide a conflict, violent and humanitarian work costs. Uh, because we we also believe that it's not just only on the table of peace talk that we can create peace. We need to do it in every step. Uh, finally, we encourage the, the religious affair department to establish the Center for Research and Communication for Coexistence in Multicultural Society. And that's like official and normally we try to help muslim brother and sister and everyone we try to show beauty of diversity we try to work with them because i think the most important in the country it's it's the acceptance of beauty of diversity uh in every way that we can do and we also brought the sdg sustainable development goals into what we're trying to do and he's a Muslim professor of the Islamic uh, University called Fatani. So even when the, the Shekun Afid of Islam in Thailand uh, provided training for their ulama or for religious leader, they also invited me to join. And we tried to send a message like Islam at Hariraya in the very important day of our Muslim brother and sister, and all national and new media all over the countries try to use everything that we can do to send a message. And even in the global level, we join with the first plan of action, as you can see, and we try to send the message for peace through <laughs> so this doll, it's just like, uh, the doll who looked like me because they wanted to to open the space for women and youth. Okay, I think that's it for what I wanted to share. I think uh, it's very important that we need to understand the context of our own country, like in Thailand. Uh, it's it would be not easy to to be the person i mean as a buddhist monk and on the table of peace talk in on track one but we can do that behind the scene and and chair and like all soldiers or authority would ask us to help with the messages and we try to do so in a very uh, peaceful way, try to do in the preventive approach all the time. So I think my time is up, right? So back to you, Martin. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Abkun Mecca, Venerable Nepan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to hear your voice. And um, Venerable Nepan is, uh, 
has been doing a lot in the background of these work, not only within Thailand, but he's been engaged with us at times on Myanmar and cross regionally. So a big thank you for all of the dedication you've put forward in this space. Um, what I'll do now is I will introduce Paula Washa Hassan. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Paula Washa. She's a senior fellow at Georgetown University Institute for Women, Peace and Security and a former fellow with the United States Institute of Peace. Paula Washa is a leading women's rights and peace actor pioneering many critical works to promote women's rights and civil society in Afghanistan. She co-founded a visionary women's movement in Afghanistan by developing the Afghan Women's Network that has played a pivotal role in women's rights and peace building for the last 26 years. She is one of the 1,000 women nominees for the Nobel Peace Prize that was established in 2005 and recently received the Hillary Rodham Clinton Award for Exceptional Leadership and Dedication to Human Rights and Women's Rights and Peacemaking. So Paula Washa, I will hand over to you and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Martin, um, and very good morning to everyone who are joining us. Um, I have a little bit technical issue with my internet, so I'm using my phone and also seeing my talking points from my laptop. So my, uh, I will rather off my video just to concentrate speaking to you. I, please apologize me for that. So um, uh, we are talking about um, uh, religious actors and uh, uh, the peace process uh, at track one and track two uh, here um, uh, in Afghanistan context is a little bit different. Um, we have conflict for last four decades. And um, uh, unfortunately, uh, the situation has been such that um, uh, uh, that uh, there have been several peace processes in between and uh, all has been focused on uh, involving political elites and those um, uh, parties who are part of the conflict itself. Um, on another hand, the other fact which is important that many of the political and um, military faction which were fighting in Afghanistan have identified themselves as religious institution as well. So um, in the process, there has been use and abuse of Islamic faith uh, for uh, promoting uh, violent conflict uh, over the years. Uh, so when I'm talking about uh, uh, religious women and women who played a, a peace um, a builder's role, um, many of them will not like even to um, identify themselves as a religious uh, women or institution, uh, but many of their inspiration is coming from uh, Islam as a faith and they use um, a religion for supporting their arguments, uh, for uh, uh, sowing the seed of peace and resolving conflict uh, in their areas. Um, as I talked about like um, uh, or over 40 years in Afghanistan, we have continuous conflict. And there have been several peace processes starting from um, a Bonn Conference um, in 2001 to uh, uh, 2020 uh, peace deal between US and Taliban. Um, in all this uh, process a uh, negotiation and political solution has been a very at the top and uh, uh, military faction level. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, in, in, in a larger extent, the common Afghan and um, uh, the voices which could have uh, contributed more positively uh, or any efforts to support the track to negotiation was uh, not really promoted in the process. Uh, and there has been a, a huge discouragement for women who, uh, movement and civil society who wanted to contribute and make that connection between track two and track one and could have influenced the peace talk uh, was even discouraged at times by all parties. However, one of the important thing which is, uh, we should mention here is the role that um, uh, uh, um, uh, these uh, um, uh, civil society groups and uh, organizations, women groups, um, including um, uh, faith leaders could have played um, uh, and have played uh, has uh, through the tremendous resilience uh, and coping strategy um, that people of Afghanistan has shown 
um, at the local level that has uh, uh, helped uh, uh, people to have reach services while the whole country was in conflict for over 40 years. And none of the government, including that was supported by the international community, was able to reach um, um, uh, foreign distance area. It was through these organizations, local organizations, that uh, people had access to services. Uh, in Even in the last uh, two decades of international engagement, you will see many of the same nature projects of the previous government, like um, uh, accelerated education program uh, for children, uh, plus um, uh, national solidarity program, all has been delivered through more formal institution of civil society um, or, or an organization who were able um, uh, through the power of uh, trust building, um, uh, bonding, and peace building at the local level uh, to be able to deliver services and help the community to benefit from uh, what come through the international support to Afghanistan. Uh, in uh, uh, the research that uh, I had with um, uh, uh, AWIC uh, and later on with uh, USIP and I, uh, I, um, ICARD, um, uh, there has been um, focus on women peace builders at the local level, many of them who were not uh, elite um, uh, leaders of the process, but at the very local and grassroots level, um, uh, uh, these women have been making tremendous work uh, to connect um, communities, to resolve conflict um, at the very uh, uh, grassroots level. And at the times they were able to um, uh, be engaged with um, uh, conflicting parties um, uh, for resolving uh, many of the difficult uh, situation, including release of their um, uh, colleagues um, uh, from uh, what uh, Taliban were um, uh, 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 taking as a hostage. Um, um, uh, promoting vaccination um, in, uh, in the places, um, uh, resolving issues of women projects in many areas which Taliban has stopped in the past. Um, but the unfortunate thing is like there hasn't been a substantive um, attention to uh, the situation of these organization and uh, women leaders who were uh, um, continue to act as a peace builder at the local level in this process. Uh, we saw through one of the assessment that we have done through Georgetown in co collaboration with the Afghan Women Network that almost 70% of the women organization inside Afghanistan has been on the face of decline because there has been been any support for this organization to continue their work. Um, uh, also, um, uh, many in, uh, uh, peace builders at the very traditional and maybe non-formal, uh, uh, like women members of Shura, um, uh, which is the local councils, or a CDC, which is um, the community development councils. These women um, uh, ha have tremendous outreach skills um, uh, and ability uh, to help building a peace at a very local level. And, um, and they has all been ignored uh, with um, uh, hasty withdrawal of international troops from Afghanistan and the whole chaos created by return of Taliban, uh, especially misusing religion to uh, confine women um, to their homes. In many cases, uh, create problems for women working outside their homes and, um, uh, and more importantly, to stop girls' schools at the secondary level where there is no example of any other Islamic country to do this. Um, I think this is the time um, uh, that uh, it was more important for these organization to be part of the uh, peace building in Afghanistan and also uh, uh, helping these women um, by facilitating um, them to negotiate for their rights. Um, um, uh, that is uh, of tremendous importance. The use of um, religion or, or the connection, I would rather say, of religion is very much important. And for Afghan women, it was always 
uh, um, uh, they see uh, that uh, religion was used as a power, but also as a uh, force of limiting women in the country. So for Afghan women, faith is more like how to defend um, uh, or uh, maybe uh, reoccupy those uh, spaces in the society to defend themselves for women. So in that case, uh, the toolkits that has been produced by Georgetown and Aisha before uh, talked about that, that's very much important that women use these arguments to um, uh, support and defend their own positions. And we need more of this kind of efforts um, uh, to help women uh, uh, to have that ability uh, to mobilize themselves but also equip them with the knowledge and give them support that they have that arguments for um, defending their rights. If you see Afghanistan is 97%, uh, uh, sorry, 99.7% uh, a Muslim uh, dominant country. Uh, and uh, if you look to the uh, efforts that have been made by women, it was always uh, that uh, uh, within the framework of Islam, although none of them has identified themselves as a religious group, but uh, um, uh, all of them has referred uh, to their rights within the framework of Islam. So um, uh, it's important, and I think this is uh, within the context of Afghanistan, maybe that is the only um, um, best way that women can um, uh, find themselves back uh, in the situation um, uh, to have uh, uh, reoccupy or um, take those spaces, which is taken every time by those um, political or um, maybe militant groups who are taking over Afghanistan and using uh, religion as a force to uh, set, uh, create setbacks for women's rights in the country. Um, it, it's also, uh, I like to share a few of the strengths that women um, um, uh, draw their strengths from uh, um, uh, for being able to use uh, that. And that reminded me of, uh, reminds me of the, uh, the last video which went viral of Afghan women who have been uh, part of the uh, relief work in uh, Paktika province. Um, uh, to help the uh, uh, people of the South affected by earthquake. Um, and these women were using, not only getting support to the communities, but uh, using that as a space, an opportunity to start negotiation with local authorities in the province and speak about what is women's right in Islam and particularly emphasizing on girls' education um, uh, and bringing that argument. So this is very much important, like uh, the, the interconnection of um, uh, spaces of women own gr uh, growth uh, and also um, uh, use of uh, uh, religious know-how for the uh, equipping and empowering women in their own society, which are um, tremendously defined by religious belief. Um, uh, although I would say that generally Afghan public are um, uh, uh, Muslim and we have fewer or minority groups who are using the very extremist definition of Islam to confine and um, uh, restrict others in the community or in the country in general. Um, uh, and Taliban regime is one of those groups. Uh, so coming back to the strengths that uh, I was talking about how and from where these women draw their strengths is, uh, first of all, um, uh, these women has uh, the, uh, know their communities at the communi uh, local level. These women know what are the power structure um, uh, with whom they should make, make their alliances. And, and that knowledge is helping them uh, to be able to defend their own position and support other women uh, in, uh, in their community. Um, the other thing is like um, they have support from um, um, men in their um, uh, community. Like we cannot 
generalize about all Afghan men not being supportive of women rights in Afghanistan. There are several um, examples, especially of those women we have worked with. They had a powerful father or brother who has supported them for what they were uh, working. Um, uh, the other thing is like the religious knowledge that they had and they have been using that as a frame of for their own activism or for their own work at a community level. And the last thing I would say, they had exceptional boldness and courage um, and that helped them uh, build a tremendous resilience and uh, being powerful for building peace and being su successful in uh, their communities. Um, well, to sum up, I would say that it's very much important uh, to focus um, on local organization of women and also peace builders and several um, uh, maybe uh, uh, traditional and non-formal uh, society is also very much important that includes these, many of these women that we have interviewed were not really educated, but still they were uh, uh, leaders who had a lot of religious inspiration, but their bigger inspiration has been peace in their own community and establishment. And uh, with that, I would stop here. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Paula Washa, for, for your sharing, um, a depth of sharing there. So thank you very much for that, Terma Kasi. Um, next, I'm gonna introduce Reverend Dr. Gary Mason, who is also a good friend that we've been working with for quite a while. Uh, um, and he has done a lot of travels back and forth from the US and Northern Ireland more recently given developments within the US space as well. Um, as an introduction, Dr. Reverend Gary Mason is a Methodist minister and senior research fellow at the Kennedy Institute for Conflict Intervention at Maynooth University in Ireland, and adjunct professor at the Candler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta. He's an advisor to the Harvard University's Negotiation Strategy Institute and the founder of the peacebuilding charity, Rethinking Conflict. Um, Reverend Gary Mason has been at in the, in the center of some of the dynamics that have happened in the Northern Ireland process and has also been engaged in the Israel-Palestine dynamics. So um, Gary, happy to hand over to you. Okay, thank you, Martine. I'll keep this short to allow for some questions. We're at 4 p.m. my time already. So I mean, I'm just going to do a couple of really broad brush strokes around this. I mean, the Northern Irish conflict historically goes back centuries, so we don't need to drill into that in any detail. Uh, really, 1969 to 1998 uh, was another, I guess you could describe, internal civil war within our tiny space. Um, and it had its roots in what I would call toxic religion and toxic politics. And yet religious actors were also key in some of those negotiations leading up to the Good Friday Agreement. Someone mentioned earlier on there, Martin, about the implementation of the agreement and there's no doubt a number of us leading up to the good friday agreement were what i would call sort of interlocutors or maybe a better phraseology is we were temperature readers for both the us government uh, the british government and the irish administration primarily taking the temperature of those groups who were pursuing terrorism or political violence and feeding that back to uh, trusted people within those administrations uh, George Mitchell, who was the American uh, Democratic senator, uh, who chaired the talks leading up to the Good Friday Agreement, said on the day it was signed, if you think getting this agreement was difficult, and it was, implementing it will be even more difficult. So sometimes getting the agreement, while it moves through protracted negotiation, the actual implementation of those peace agreements sometimes are more difficult and more protracted. I mean, I would still want to suggest, and I often say to colleagues, uh, both of them, the Irish, British and American administration, and particularly I say this in the States, I mean, the Good Friday Agreement was one of the most successful pieces of American foreign policy in the last 50 years. I mean, there's no question about that. But holding the agreement together at times has been fraught with difficulty for a multiplicity of reasons. Uh, concepts that were set in the Good Friday Agreement, like weapons decommissioning, release of prisoners, reform of policing. Some of those just have not been scheduled in relation to the timetable that was set in the Good Friday Agreement. 
Um, so since that agreement, I mean, as a religious actor with others, uh, we have had to negotiate internally three to four internal uh, terrorist feuds, internally within organizations that were involved in political violence. Uh, one of the main uh, non-state actors in our conflict, the Ulster Volunteer Force, who were uh, pro-unionist, pro-British, they read their weapons decommissioning statement at my church building. And I think that was a very tangible way of people of faith stepping into the space. Now, we had our critics for that. People were critical of me saying, you're letting people uh, read a statement in relation to weaponry from your building, but those are what I call uh, thoughtful, prophetic, strategic risks. Uh, I think it's crucial that the church has to step into those difficult spaces. Because as one writer said uh, from the South African context, reconciliation is no cheap matter. It does not come about by simply papering over deep-seated differences. Reconciliation presupposes confrontation. Uh, without that, we do not get reconciliation, but merely a temporary glossing over of differences. And the person suggests the running sores of society cannot be healed with the use of a sticking plaster. So suggesting that real reconciliation, not superficial reconciliation, and I think sometimes we need to be honest as religious actors, we, we assume that if we can get uh, in our Christian context anyway, I let people from other world faiths speak for themselves, that if we just get a, a group in my context of uh, Protestants and Catholics in the same room worshiping together, all is well. But I think reconciliation presupposes an operation, a cutting to the very bone without an ascetic. I mean, as the Venerable Nepal highlighted there, context is absolutely crucial and important in relation to this. And unless we analyze contextually why the conflict began, bringing a group of people together for a worship service, to my mind, is not going to cut it. Um, I spent 28 years in parish ministry since 2015 onwards. I've been working still on the island of Ireland, but doing more work in the United States and also in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And it's important to say for all of us, no matter what space we have expertise in, uh, the Good Friday Agreement is not the panacea for other global spaces. But I would say there are lessons from the Good Friday Agreement that do have applicability in other spaces. Because our peace agreement is held now for 25 years, and anyone that knows Irish history, it's been a series of uprisings, uh, revolutions, rebellions, going back hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, over the last 10 years, I've hosted around 1,000 Israelis and Palestinians uh, within Belfast of all shades of opinion, um, not just people who are center or left or right, but of all different shades of opinion. And some of the lessons we have learned together is that political leadership is essential to achieving peace, that really leaders on all sides of those conflicts must sincerely believe that change is preferable to the status quo, and then actually be willing to take the risks to achieve peace. And religious actors can be in the room and in those spaces with key political actors, ensuring them of their support as they take those risks. Because taking those risks are dangerous. I mean, for some people, they can result in expulsion or in death. Because they also have a political base that they need to maintain as they move forward. Another concept I think that is worthwhile highlighting is that there arose a desire to break the cycle of violence to save future generations from the horrors of conflict. And because of that desire, that encouraged leaders to take risks, face down accusations of betrayal from their own communities to achieve peace. And again, religious actors were able to partner with many political leaders, ensuring them that this was the way forward and that their various religious constituencies were supportive of the role they were taking. Literally every Israeli and Palestinian has said to me in the context of Belfast, Gary, you don't understand. And I say, tell me, what do I not understand? And they say, we don't trust each other. But I want to suggest that a lack of trust 
between opposing sides is actually an inevitable feature of building peace. But we cannot continue to use it as a justification for not building or beginning the process. So I think religious actors need to be saying, trust will not begin at the beginning of a process, but only through time, through dialogue, meeting secretly at times, by making commitments and by building confidence through concrete actions. I think religious actors can come alongside political actors in relation to that and ensure that trust will evolve over a period of time. Another lesson we've learned is that attempts to resolve conflict through military force were ultimately futile and they didn't result in sustainable security for either community. So simply in our context, you kill one of us, we kill one of yours. We achieve security. When dialogue was prioritized, the root causes of the conflict were addressed by the establishment of new frameworks, political institutions that gave space for each community to peacefully pursue their visions for Northern Ireland or the North of Ireland. And civic society was key in that. We have a theory here, I don't have time to drill into it today. We talk about the political peace process and the social peace process. And civic society need to be really, really part of that social peace process. Our peace process at times have been stop start, but often people have said to me, because if you follow Irish politics at all, within this Northern Irish space, uh, we had no devolved assembly 2017 to 2020, we have none at the moment, despite elections we had six or seven months ago. And people often ask, why have you not gone back to violence? And one of the key components is that civic society has been the social glue that has held our peace process together. So I'm going to suggest that in that civic society, we need a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, we need NGOs in the room. We need women's groups. We need religious actors. We need academics. We need business people. And to my mind, while we have an imperfect peace process, it is not utopia. But there have been no serious deaths here now, 25 years coming April next year. And I think that multidisciplinary approach to peace building, bringing all sides to the table, has been absolutely crucial. And finally, Martin, just to say that moving people into the same room with different viewpoints has been crucial. I mean, a number of times every year, I chair this island-wide dialogue group called Compass Points. And really, our mantra is, to disagree well, you must first understand well. So religious actors have the ability to bring people into the room, not, not necessarily to become a homogenous group, but at least to understand the other person's perspective and to humanize the other person. And I find that has been pretty profound. So look, I'll press the pause button there to let us get a few questions in for folk before 20 minutes evolve. So back to you. I'm going to open. Thank you, Gary. It's always a pleasure. It's always insightful to, to hear from you. I took note of, of your, your quote that I will definitely share and contribute <laughs> to you. Um, I'm going to hand over to Paula Washa. Paula Washa is going to moderate questions coming in. Um, Paula Washa. Thank you, Martine, and thank you to our speakers. We had a lot of questions coming in, some of them very, very difficult, um, and some of them I think that are more easier to uh, talk about. Um, as uh, Aisha was talking uh, and giving the presentation, there was a question about um, if, if she could explain a little bit more uh, the, the way you talked about religion as a fault line, if you could expand on that, that would be helpful. And um, the second question, which I'm going to actually open up to everybody after, and Aisha, you can answer this as well, is um, are religious actors only mobilizing or more influential for an older population? Um, do they also mobilize youth? Are there youth religious actors that are mobilizing uh, people for peace or youth for peace? If you could speak to that connection, that area, um, that would also be helpful. So we'll do one round of two questions and then we'll go on to the next questions as well. Aisha, would you like to start us off? Yes, thank you so much, Paul Wash, and thank you for those questions. 
Uh, first, what we mean by re religion as a fault line is that while religion is not necessarily the source of the conflict, but the parties to a conflict are divided along religious identities. So religion itself is not the problem, but because communities identify with their religion and the, uh, the religion becomes a tool for political leaders to be mobilizing their populations to fight against each other. So think of like um, uh, the ex-Yugoslavian uh, conflict, while the conflict was not really about religion, but the parties were divided along Muslim, Bosnians versus Orthodox Serbians. But so the identity of the religious identity played an important role among who the parties are. So that's what we mean by that. So those divisions have been easy to mani be manipulated by groups. In terms of the second question, whether religious actors are more influential among older people as opposed to young people, that depends who the religious actors are. There's a lot of religiosity among young people as well. And um, so one of the things that we're looking at is not any religious actor, but which religious actor is more influential among youth. Youth have been um, also mobilized, religious youth have been mobilized for peace as well by religious actors who they found influential. I think the important thing is that we need to understand who are more able to reach the youth versus who are more able to reach the older generations. And so we're having a more intersectional approach that takes age and ethnicity etc. is very important as we go ahead. I hope this was sufficient answer. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. I'm wondering if um, the Venerable Nepan has examples of mobilizing youth and some ex examples there as well as um, Reverend Mason and Pawasha. Yes, definitely. I think uh, in Thailand, it's not about the old population, but it's about the old paradigm of religious actors that make, you know, youth ignore them. But it, like, for example, myself in the last year, uh, we went on Facebook Live and then some of my friends got 2,000, 200,000 K, 200,000, 200,000 viewer at at the particular time, I mean, at the same time, or uh, myself, after when book online, then we got attention from young generation. So my follower from 2000 increased to uh, 36K. So it kind of the uh, very interesting. And because of that, also, we engage them by this kind of thing, right? So you can see the, the comic. <laughs> and for SDGs, and we also use the circular economy to, to drive it. So it means we not just only bring peace in terms of the peace work, but we also try to bring inner peace and outer peace as well. Peace in heart start in one hand. So I think it depends on that. Young generation also care about peace deeply. They try to change the social structure. So when religious leader like us approach them and open the space for them, they more than happy to, to work with us and some of them work for us. And also at the same time, we also try to work for them as well because in many areas, we need to empower youth and women as well. So I try to use like these doll because young generation create these, these they love man so much, then they turn the dolls, the bear, and look like me, you can see. And this is kind of their, when their, you know, combination or integration of new, new paradigm, old paradigm from religion can work together to better society. Thank you. Thank you for that, Venerable Nepan. And we also have research that shows that communities are more resilient to violence when the youth have this better connection with their elders uh, on that level. So you gave some very beautiful examples of that. Um, would Reverend Mason or Palwasha also like to answer this question before we move on? Reverend Mason, you're, you're muted. Yeah, we just very quickly there, Palwasha. Um, I have developed a young emerging leaders group within our Irish context. Um, some would be practicing faith, others of absolutely no interest. And I think that 
because you're a religious leader, it doesn't mean you cannot move in the spaces where people don't necessarily share your worldview. Um, also that compass points groups I alluded to, I've ensured that a significant number of that group is part of that uh, dialogue group. I think we also need to be careful as well, and I'm speaking again from the Irish context, so I'm not saying this globally, there can be a tendency for those who live through the conflict to dump all the rubbish in that conflict on the next generation very, very easily, and that shapes them as well. Um, so we need to be careful not to do that. And I mean, if anyone has any, you know, I often say to myself, I will never ever do another PhD at my age, but if I was to do one, I would do it in the role of religion and memory. How we pass toxic memory from generation to generation to generation in all our world faiths and how we demonize the other. Uh, so we need to find a way of telling stories without demonizing other people as human beings. Uh, as I often say, we may not say it, and I think uh, Asha said it very, very well, we may not be using religious motifs, but we kind of sociologically take religion and do a bit of othering of the others who don't share our space. So I think religious actors need to be very careful around language and, you know, quoting Jonathan Sachs's phrase there, be careful we're not using linguistic violence of the other in the public space, because linguistic violence, as we all know, eventually needs to balance physically. Thank you so much, Reverend Mason. I think that's a really important point, both on um, how these cycles can get ingrained into our narratives, but also leaving, like you were saying, some of this baggage onto the next generation. So one of the things we're looking at actually um, in partnership with ICRD is uh, looking at working with religious actors on trauma healing in this space and how to break that cycle of conflict uh, with religious actors being mindful of how to, to uh, really work in that space of psychosocial support and healing and trauma um, to end that cycle. So um, I want to turn over, Paul Washa, is there anything you would like to add here before we move on? Uh, thank you, Paul Washa. I One of the things which I would speak from an Afghan context is that um, uh, the biggest recruiter or possibility for youth, uh, a country which is like 70% young population, uh, has been uh, through the terrorist and extremist group only. And we had a huge uh, disenfranchised group of young people who hasn't been involved or uh, were not given the opportunity to be part of development or um, have possibility of work. And this uh, cycle continues even up to today. Many of the uh, foot soldiers of Taliban are approaching NGOs, including women organization, and they're uh, seeking work. And this is very much important because focus on these young people to have opportunity of delivering something better, educating them and having that chance of integrating into society in a more peaceful way, because we are dealing with a cycle of violence over generation and um, uh, with a less focus on helping and um, uh, uh, peaceful in integration of um, uh, these men who have learned nothing but violence. Thank you, Paul Shijan. I think that's a really important point. And you, you remind me of the work that we've done in Afghanistan on peaceful masculinities, uh, particularly in, in targeting that um, issue of masculinity around, uh, you know, some of the toxic masculinity issues. Um, you know, another question came in specifically for you, Paul Shijan, about, you know, what is a way that you could work in Afghanistan currently to train women? Um, and I think that's both for Aisha and to Paul Washa about, you know, how do you engage in the current context in Afghanistan with the Taliban crack crackdown um, on education and particularly targeting uh, of Hazara girls, for example, in, in Afghanistan, we saw the, um, the horrific violence that unfolded last week in this space. Um, can you speak a little bit to that? Yes, um, that was so unfortunate. The last incident, which killed uh, more than thirty-five young women, life uh, in that uh, suicide bombing uh, by one of the extremist group. But unfortunately, this is not the only case and has our communities, which is uh, raising the risk of genocide in my country, um, is very uh, horrific and uh, 
uh, uh, difficult. Uh, but uh, over 40 years, if we look to what women has done in Afghanistan, um, is to work along all these difficult lines. And uh, uh, we have our contacts inside the country with women groups, with women leaders, and they are able to uh, work around this. For instance, the uh, relief to the families has been um, uh, started by Afghan recently diaspora, or maybe previous uh, to give relief to the families. Um, uh, but coming back to how to train and uh, uh, be able to mobilize women better uh, to, um, to have that chance, I think uh, I might emphasize and I'm being advocating again and again that women groups are the most important institutions. Um, uh, although there is very little uh, possibility for these women organization because Taliban are not uh, accepting anything beyond maybe immediate relief work and other, which they need to deliver to the communities. Uh, and they are giving um, some uh, possibility uh, of, well, not really possibility, but not stopping uh, some organization to uh, work in the community. And I think these are important venues for women to use. Uh, and Afghan women learn over the years because this is not the only wave of violence and uh, extremism in the country. We had it and uh, difficulties in Mujahideen's time. We had it in them um, uh, when uh, uh, women uh, were confined to their homes during um, uh, uh, the Cold War and um, uh, rise of um, religious uh, Islam and extremism uh, among the uh, refugee communities in that time. Uh, there have been very little opportunities for women and women use of those like homeschools, um, uh, uh, specific women centers, and, and they come back. And I think um, uh, uh, and, and that strategy need to be supported. Uh, I've been speaking again and again on the issue that Afghan women have learned how to rise back from ashes. And I think that initiatives that women are taking, that's important to be supported, invested in, um, and promoted. Thank you, Oshajan. That's that's a really good point that women are really important to invest in and that they're really at the cutting edge. They're the ones demonstrating. They're the ones that are doing some very courageous acts in Afghanistan at this time. Um, and uh, that there's a lot of change that can happen with the women who's been invested in so far. There's um, three more questions that I'd like to ask um, of all of you. Uh, one is specifically about interfaith initiatives. If you could speak to an example of an interfaith initiative that you've done that has worked, uh, particularly in de-escalating conflict. Um, and then the second is, what kind of skills or awareness or capacity building do secular diplomats and mediators need to effectively co-lead or collaborate with religious actors? Um, and finally, the big question uh, is what can be done about two issues, the Russia-Ukraine conflict and the polarization in the United States. So we have uh, the last five minutes of this conversation. I'd like to open it up and just each one of you give your uh, answers and final comments to uh, these last questions. So um, let me start with Venerable Nepal. Thank you. Uh, Paul Sha, uh, the last question I would put in the very good hands, not mine. <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to answer the second question. Uh, the, the first question, right, is about interfaith initiative. I think uh, we need to, to do that both formal and informal. For, for example, in the Deep South, we also used to face the problem that our Buddhist, our Buddhist and Muslim brother and sister hated the word multicultural or multi-faith or interfaith because they felt that, you know, the, the government wanted them to have a picture together, for example. So it's not easy to, to make it happen in the formal way. So we need to do it in, term, in, in the personal level. So for example, I asked, you know, our Muslim brother and sister, young one, that here in the deep south you are majority so help us approach our brother our buddhist brother and sister and help them uh make space to talk together 
find something to work together. We don't need to talk about the the principle of each religion, but you can uh, do like water management, uh, recycle thing, uh, environmental protection, for example, together, and that more effective because it's about open space of your heart to know each other to work together and then the formal one not that hard anymore because when they when they know each other they work together that we can put everything on the table for for talk peace process and i even invited uh, our muslim brother from the deep south to be one of my committee i mean foundation and right now we work together and we work with the COFAC Thailand, with the Google New Initiative, because some part of the problem, it's related to fake news and misinformation. So that we need to, that can be answered in terms of polarization in the US as well, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. So I learned a lot from, especially, you know, our great Aisha and the Reverend Dr. Gary Mason. Thank you very much. So who would like to answer those questions next? Uh, maybe I can um, add to um, uh, regarding um, uh, what has been done um, in Afghanistan. I think um, uh, the issue of um, um, uh, fragmentation in the society um, along uh, religious sect, because we are uh, as I said, dominant Muslim country, but uh, Shia and uh, Sunni India uh, have been some uh, division, uh, which is associated also with ethnicity as well. And, and I'm seeing the trend which has been uh, started with the haters is now turning to more peace, uh, where, um, um, for instance, the recent attack on the Hazara communities, you are seeing uh, in Pashtun belt areas that women and men are coming in support of the Hazara community and they're introducing themselves as Hazara themselves. And I think these are powerful a way of um, 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 binding and uh, 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 starting back that peace between the communities. And uh, it's already um, affecting the language, um, at least in the social media, uh, which has been very toxic for um, last one year in particular. And there has been a lot of hatred languages against one another. Um, what I personally have done, I think over the years, we had many occasions um, that we had uh, um, uh, sectorial violence um, uh, promoted through this political um, uh, and military fighting between different factions of um, uh, uh, Mujahideen groups and later on with the Taliban when um, in, in one instance when um, there was um, attacks on Hazara community and many people were killed and slaughtered by Taliban in that time. So uh, uh, we have started in the refugee communities um, the Mahram uh, uh, mourning um, uh, religious uh, rituals in our own centers uh, so that uh, uh, the community around us uh, who were Shia uh, and they had lesser of opportunity then and also to show that gesture that we are not part of this um, uh, what is going on and we don't agree with that we had that religious um, uh, rituals in our own uh, centers um, uh, and, and that had a tremendous impact on uh, feeling of unity and togetherness uh, and solidarity. Thank you, Paul Shitan. I remember the blue scarves for peace, the women all, all joining together, praying for peace and demonstrating for peace together. It was a very powerful movement. Um, so let me turn it over quickly uh, to Aisha and then we'll have Reverend Mason close us out. Please, Aisha. Yes, we have very little time, so I'll be very, very brief. I think interfaith dialogues are really, really important. I've some worked some on um, interfaith dialogues in the context of like Niger and Chad and where we brought together. But one of the things that was important was to have the local communities be very much involved in the um, process itself. So we had a lot of uh, 
great participation. There was a lot of um, great conversation about how their faith traditions can help minimize or sort of address early warning. In Niger, the case was much more early warning. So I thought that was a pretty successful attempt that we had. So I think it's very important to have it both at the grassroots and at the space level. Thank you so much for all the questions and everyone. Thank you, Aisha. Reverend Mason. Okay, just a couple of quick comments. So uh, interfaith example, a couple of things, and I know people uh, would say, why were Christians killing each other in Northern Ireland? But basically those two groupings saw themselves almost nearly as not of the same faith. Uh, so one of the things we did, if someone was murdered on either side, a Catholic priest, Protestant clergy person, went and visited the family together to humanize the whole thing. So you were expressing, this does not represent my community from the Catholic side or from the Protestant side. Other things say just in Israel at the moment, there's a project in the mixed cities. We all know May last year, 2021, uh, the mixed cities in Israel almost descended into absolute anarchy. Um, but there's now an initiative there that I've been involved in that I spoke on a long, long time ago uh, called Inside Mediators, where a clergy person or a religious actor from the Jewish tradition and the Islamic tradition do inside mediation together. Sometimes we need to bring in the third parties from outside, but sometimes we need to indigenously grow those people who belong, or in other words, who are, as a friend of mine says, are stitched into the fabric of their own society. We need to bring those people into the room. Secular diplomats, I mean, I've worked very, very closely with many, many diplomats. I mean, as part of a group I host of Israelis, Palestinians, every year here under a Harvard program, a third of them are diplomats, uh, working alongside religious actors as well. I think we really, really need to nourish that. And maybe that's something the people that are hosting this can ask questions about. What does that look like? How do we complement each other? Et cetera, et cetera, as well. The Russian Ukraine, no time to drill down into it, but I was chatting to some of my colleagues here on Sunday when we were doing another one of these webinars together. They're not finding about doctrinal issues. Uh, but as Putin said, the Russian Orthodox Church was born in Kiev and Kiev is the cradle of Russian Orthodoxy. So while it's not a doctrinal debate, it's a combination of ethnic, nationalistic religion spilling into that space. The US, very, very quickly, I mean, listen, there'll be 101 PhD thesis has done what has happened in the US in the last number of years, to put it mildly. But you only need to look at the Capitol building on January the 6th, where you had a gallows next to a cross, et cetera, et cetera. And as soon as one of the, the Proud Boys get into the rotunda in that building, we knelt down and prayed, Lord, thank you for giving us back America. So there's a religious component around that as well, as we all know. But that's a conversation, I guess, for another day. Just to also say the Carter Center, I'm working pretty closely with at the moment in Atlanta. They have a project, Google it, called The Rule of Faith in Saving Democracy, where they're trying to bring uh, religious actors together. They're both Republican and Democrat. I know, Martin, you're doing some of this work as well for what we call in Ireland uncomfortable conversations, and they are gonna be pretty uncomfortable, but they're incredibly necessary. I will finish there. <laughs> Thank you so much about for ending on that note of uncomfortable conversations and how we, we need to push ourselves into that space of uncomfortable conversations if we're really going to solve conflict. Um, and that conflict is inevitable, but we have to have those uncomfortable conversations in order to get to a place of peace. So thank you so much um, to all of you, to all the panelists. I think this is an excellent conversation. I know there are more questions for you, uh, for all of you, but also specifically for Reverend Mason in the chat. I don't know if there's some resources perhaps you can share with those who are interested. Um, we'd be happy to share our own resources, so please get in touch with uh, Alliance for Peace Building, and we'll be happy to share resources through that. Um, my apologies for going over, but I think this is a very rich conversation and very hard to stop because there are so many important points to be made here. Uh, but I thank you all for joining us. Over to you, Martin. Martin. All right. Thank you all. Um, a big thank you to all the panelists that, that pulled together. A thank you to all of the attendees. And a big thank you to the people behind it all, um, Suvaraj uh, and Melis. Um, they have been pushing and pulling this together behind the scenes and very thankful for AFP and ICRD, USIP colleagues, 